another winter at Buffalo Airways. Freeze your hands once and they're frozen for life. And another brutal season of flying in the most severe conditions on Earth. Oh, shit. We just lost on your own pressure. Is it uh, flickering? Yeah, it's going poof, poof, poof. We can see a blue flame. I can feel my heart beating. Despite the danger, a new batch of eager recruits. I have this burning desire to fly. You know, once that minus 50 hits, that's going to be rough. He's already thinking it's cold. He won't last here. Fact is, they work for the toughest boss in the business. I'll just hound the living shit up until he quit. Jules just quit in Hay River. Joe and his beloved warbirds are under pressure. Antique airplanes, antique fuel. Dealing with fucking worn out junk. He doesn't like to see any of these old airplanes die. Joe's clients are demanding newer, faster planes. Get rid of the old DC-4s and bring in the new Electras. Hey, that's catch all the whole thing. Joe's family straining to steer Buffalo through changing times. Well, who the is in charge of the operation? My business. The family worked for the business. Let's go, Senators! And Joe's concerned they're not putting the business first. Joe's hiring a new Top Gun to turn it all around. Because I'm a damn good manager, and that's it. You got to recognize, to make change, people are going to get upset. What is he doing? He's a yes man, eh? Is that what people actually think over there, that this guy's going to change the world? The thing is, you try to weed out the bad, two more come in. He's <laughs> slithering around like a <laughs> snake watching us. You're going to see people just start dropping like flies. <laughs> Best thing for Buffalo, get rid of them all, start fresh. your hats, boy. Early every morning, 66-year-old Joe McBrien, sole owner of Buffalo Airways, heads from his home in Hay River to the local airport to pilot a DC-3 that's as old as he is. This daily scheduled passenger flight is the one constant at Buffalo. In the aviation business in the north, to have a, a five-year plan or three-year plan is totally a waste of time. Things will change, but you can't put your hand on where. You just got to be prepared to change with the times. Across Great Slave Lake and Yellowknife, Joe's youngest son, Mikey, heads to the hangar. You know, when I was born, Buffalo Airways was already around for 12 years. Um, so I've really grown up in a, into a, a company that uh, has evolved and has changed over time. In a flying career that spanned a half century, Buffalo Joe has always been able to adapt. But Mikey sees those days dwindling. My dad's not getting any younger. You know, he's in his uh, tail end of his 60s. So he's, um, so he's only got a few more years left. But Joe's not planning on leaving anytime soon. It's my business. The family worked for them. And if the family want to take it over, fine. I'll let them take it over. But they got to take it over. They just can't ride the highway. You got to really want it. But Joe hasn't seen that passion from Mikey. Yeah, it's my father's airline right now, and he's designed it the way he likes it. Um, for me to take over, I'd have to uh, make some changes. Joe has a change of his own in store, a shakeup for everyone. That change is Dwayne Hicks. Before coming to Yellowknife, Dwayne spent 20 years running his family's airline charter business in Ontario. When I was away from aviation for three to four years. Always wanted to get back, and when I got back into it, I wanted to be back at a pivotal role. Well, Dwayne is a third generation aviation, and he brings a lot of knowledge with him, a lot of administrative expertise with him. That's what we'll do. Which is why Joe has gathered his management team for a big announcement. Okay, so what we have here is uh, your new chief manager. 
When it comes to my father, it's never really a discussion. It's really orders. From my perspective, uh, Dwayne just showed up out of the blue. And now, he's Buffalo's senior manager. And that means Mikey has to answer to Dwayne. There's where we are, but whatever happens. I've been here, you know, on and off for about 13 years. He's completely uneducated in anything I do. I don't think it's the proper way to do things. It's close. If anybody's got any input or anything like that, we, we will always keep updating. He's educated. He's got a, he's keen. He's got lots of confidence. Well, we'll see how that pans out. No one else has been able to uh, calm the beast anyway, so. And Dwayne may want more. Joe's not getting any younger. He needs a little bit of a succession plan. And uh, he needs somebody to step up. I definitely could see myself with Buffalo in the future. And uh, I'm going to be somewhere in a uh, major role. I'll follow up with the updates. He's very, very city-like. We're a little bit more laid back, because it is a family here. All right, that sounds good. And for now, Joe's keeping it in the family, not announcing the news of Dwayne's appointment to the rest of the company. So in the meantime, the business of Buffalo goes on. Today, DC-3 Captain Gord Cooling is getting ready to head to the high Arctic. Get 80 knots of winds. But Joe wants to take another good look at the weather up there. You're going out as a straight freighter, eh? Yeah. Gord will face some of the most challenging conditions in the world, but he knows what he's up against. Most of the time, we don't have radio reception. For hundreds of miles, we can't talk to anybody. The weather in the high Arctic is uh, usually very bad. You get um, a lot of low vis, ice fog, and you get Arctic storms. Humidity from the Arctic Ocean can roll inland and hit extreme cold, suddenly creating dense ice fog. The wreckage of crashed planes along the coast testifies to the perils of flying in those conditions. So it's not for the faint of heart, it's not to be taken lightly, the weather up there, especially in, in the fall. Yeah. Gord's mission is to move the belongings of two Mounties. First stop, Kugluktuk, 600 kilometers north on the Arctic coast. Then fly another 900 kilometers to Tuluyawak, the most northerly settlement on the Canadian mainland. Further north than Gord's ever flown before. Just 25 years old, Gord's not only the youngest captain at Buffalo. Gord's the youngest DC-3 captain in the world. Sean Barry's like five, six years older than him, and he's his co-pilot. It really depends on the weather. Like, we'll be checking the weather. Gord and Sean cut their teeth as Joe's co-pilots on the sked. And flying with them is apprentice mechanic Travis Dyson. Gord will rely on him if something goes wrong with the plane. They're keen, they're bright, they're sharp. They're focused, and that's what you really need. That's what it's all about. Gord's, he's, he's doing really well, and trips like this actually um, add to his confidence of, hey, maybe we could send Gord to the top of the world and not have to worry about it. Trips along the Arctic coast that time of year is, is not something for everybody. I've, I've seen a lot of very experienced people not be able to do those type of trips. Alpha 500, clear for takeoff, runway 09. Hey, you're Gord and Sean settle in for the four hour flight due north. On board, two moving men to help with the Mountie relocation. Arctic radio there. I was wondering if we could pass along uh, the weather you just got from the Temperature is a lovely minus 33. After a smooth flight, they're now on approach to Kugluktuk, the first of two stops. Booking authority on Buffalo 708 is final. Time to go to the freezing cold. Yeah. On the ground in Kugluktuk, they quickly get the first truckload off the plane. But then, bad news. 
Tuluyawak, their next stop, is socked in with a major storm. If things don't change, the Buffalo crew will be stuck here. As Mikey McBrien wakes up, newly hired senior manager Dwayne Hicks is already out the door. You gotta love the nurse. He's wasting no time getting started on changing things at Buffalo. It's not about bragging about it, but when I had my company, I was first one there and last one to leave. That's just the way I am. Dwayne quickly moves in on Mikey's territory, including his office. Why am I here in Mikey's office? Because uh, this is kind of operations. I can maybe help them kind of make decisions. Dwayne's first task was efficiency. When you look at the schedule, who's, who's scheduling, there's no management. They schedule themselves. The way we're doing things is the way we've always done them. You know, we'll get a little more structure around here, because that's what Joe has put on. He's mandated myself to just kind of look over everything. It's not my company. It's, it's Joe's company, but I'm passionate about being part of it. There may be a new senior manager, but for now, Mikey's supposed to be supervising the courier business called Buffalo Express. Buffalo Express is a huge part of Buffalo Warriors, and really, the money maker is the parcel service. It's going downtown, my route, so goes in the van. It's not flashy, but it pays the bills. But lately, Mikey's focus hasn't been zeroed in on Buffalo Express. He's also launched a lucrative retail business selling T-shirts out of his new shop in the hangar. Pre-bagged and everything. I gotta love it. Right here, you see, is the new reason why the old man would be yelling at me. Mikey's just put the Buffalo I mean, logo I mean, on just about anything. Like These are my number one seller. These are the panties. As you can see, that uh, you got a Buffalo on the front and the Buffalo on the back. And Since like he started it stuff. two years ago, oh, yeah, Buffalo Wearwear has sold hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of merchandise but it comes at a cost. Being a uh, general manager and working this uh, t-shirt store really generally doesn't work together. I find myself torn sometimes between um, business of flying airplanes and business of supplying airplane themed t-shirts. And the courier business may be starting to suffer. That's gonna get everyone in fucking shit. Fucking Kenny. His 18-year-old nephew, Kenny, who works as a driver, still hasn't delivered an important package. And it's getting late. I thought he was delivering it. I, I don't know, you called me, he was... Hey, Kenny, you're making up I excuses. Buffalo Express, under Mikey's supervision, looks out of control. No, no. The other driver, I'm not saying to anybody, has 20 packages right now that is not delivered. I have 15 packages that is not delivered because I don't have time. Rampies like Larry Dussault are overworked and overwhelmed. It's in my van, I'll go do it. And the performance of the courier division... We got a general manager, we got an office manager, we got nobody managing... ...is embarrassing Joe. I go downtown right now, I don't even want to go through town with the name on my truck. Too many complaints, and we are oblivious to it. There's no leadership. And we go through this every day. Do you, do, you, do you think a lot of these guys now that, that they just kind of organize themselves who's doing what? It's the first time Mikey has to answer to the new senior manager. But the buck still stops with Joe, and he delivers an ultimatum. We've got to get our priorities straight right now. We've got to manage and operate. If not, then it's out of your hands. And you'll be replaced by somebody who'll take care of Buffalo business. In his eyes, everything was wrong. It's never going to be perfect, right? There's always going to be mistakes. And he focuses on the smallest mistakes and makes everybody worry and, and fret. It's a new era at Buffalo. Running the business now trumps family ties. You got to recognize to make change, people are going to get upset. 600 kilometers north in the hamlet of Kogluktuk, DC-3 pilots Gord and Sean are at a standstill. It's minus 33. I'm glad there's no wind. There may be no wind here, but raging Arctic storms have suddenly flared up around their destination further north, leaving them just one option. Wait. Wait is all we can do. I just want to get this done and 
to home. It's, uh, it's very frustrating. I kept trying to keep myself in check and, you know, I'm not gonna push it, I'm not gonna push it. You know, if the weather isn't good, it kind of like, you know, you're already kind of nervous to do the flight in the first place if something goes wrong. So if it isn't like uh, ideal, then it makes it a pretty easy decision. Gord has to have really good weather because you don't want to turn around because you don't have enough fuel to turn around. So it's got to be perfect. The third member of the crew, apprentice mechanic Travis Dyson, is part of another family dynasty at Buffalo. His father, Cliff, is a veteran mechanic, and brother Curtis is also an apprentice. Travis needs experience and all that, but the only way you can learn is jump on the airplane, go be the apprentice, and that's the best way to learn. Fathers and sons working in one place. Buffalo is a family-run. How was the holiday? Family-oriented business. For now. New senior manager Dwayne Hicks is making the rounds. But no one on the floor has been told who he is. I've been talking to most people in the company, and a lot of them don't even know who I am. And that's that's kind of a neat thing, because you can really hear the, you know, the real bitches. Oh, that fucking Joe, he's this, he's that, he's a and this shit. And, I, and, and first thing that comes to my head is, number one, you don't even know who I am. You think I'm a friend of some rampy. And number two, here you are talking about the guy who signs your paycheck. What is he doing? I don't know. I don't know. He's doing all of our I don't know. <laughs> it's just comical to hear how you know, people show their colors so you know who the loyal ones are. <laughs> but Dwayne can't stay undercover forever. Kelly, can like you meet Dwayne Hicks? I bet you were a friend of one of the rampies. I had yeah. no idea who you were. Joe's brought Dwayne in to you know, help out with sales and operations, the whole works. So when he come over to the food mill, he's just taking a look. Yeah. Over no, I'm not trying to ridicule anybody or anything like that. because it's I felt kind of stupid. First, he's quizzed me about, what do you think about Buffalo Joe? Well, you know, he can be all right, but he can sure be a sometimes and it's like oh great yeah you're just one of those you know informants of buffalo slithering around like a <laughs> snake watching us pretending you're a friend of a rampy you bastard <laughs> when you're actually checking up on me <laughs> with Dwayne in charge Mikey could have some time on his hands I don't know what they're doing with Mikey now like I don't know maybe Mikey's doing something different I don't know I really own. have no idea if his job's jeopardized by the newbie or what Where's your stick? Where's your stick? <laughs> what? Well, I think it's a good promotion. Change is underway at Buffalo. The question is, how will Mikey find his place? Come here. At the end of a rough day, Mikey needs to unwind. There's nothing like having a few beers with the guys after work, you know, to release some stress. Tagging along is newly hired senior manager, Dwayne Hicks. He's not really drinking. He's watching Mikey drinking with Buffalo employees. And Dwayne's taking mental notes. They're sitting at the same table and they're buying each other's drinks. But then you get out to work the next day and if Mikey says, oh, well, you know what, I need you to do this, oh, well, you. That's, that's what happens. You get way too close to your employees, and all of a sudden, you're best buds. You can't be best buds. You have to be able to go out to Surly Bob's, do your thing, go to your fight night, buy the group a bunch of beers as a manager, and leave. Now that Dwayne is calling the shots, a lot of things at Buffalo are going to change. Mikey McBrien is at work early this morning, following a new rule laid down by Dwayne. We got this new rule where I'm not, I'm not allowed to go into the office until 10 o'clock until everything's done. But Mikey won't be out in the cold alone. You've got to look after what right now where the company is making its money, and that's, that's career and uh, freight. We want to look it over. I want to hopefully streamline that. That's why I'm here. I'm not here to kick ass. I don't want to kick ass. But he's not doing enough work. They tell you you got to do more, meaning that everything you're managing perfectly uh, doesn't mean at all. Hey. But Pac 
packages are still getting misdirected. What the f is it? This is going to Edmonton. They just don't want to organize themselves. You know your route? Yeah, I know. I don't know why it takes a fellow like myself to, that comes along and can recognize that. It's just a matter to have everything ready when you yeah, get to the route. Yeah, ready. So many times, front so back. times I come like from There's front so to much back. Forces, and like, I want, I'll have to go back to the place twice. <laughs> Maybe it just takes that outside influence to get stuff done. The problem I have is I've been here since 1996, so it's all normal to me. The chaos, the business is normal. It's like, it's normal. Even with Dwayne watching his every move, Mikey still overlooks some parcels, a sure way to lose courier business. One, two, three, four things. Now that we identified that, he's going to make sure that goes. Any of the courier drivers there? Can you send one over to pick up this freight? I'll help him load. I'd like to straighten courier out. But to do so, there has to be change. You don't really need middle management. You just need that courier to run smoothly. In the high Arctic, there's good news. There's a small window of clear weather. After being stuck here overnight, DC-3 Captain Gord Cooling and his crew are ready to fly. Okay. Yeah, we found a break and, and took it. Kilometers later, the DC-3 approaches its destination. Looks a lot like you're you're on the moon. Where a grateful Mountie is happy to finally receive his stuff. Well, we're in Tolowiak, Nunavut, and uh, my car was finally arrived with Buffalo Air, and so we're unloading it and getting it to my my uh, place where my wife is eagerly awaiting it. They managed to get in here with a break in the weather, but on the Arctic coast, things can change fast. We unloaded the airplane pretty quick. Last door on the right. They need to be quick and get back in the air while the visibility is good. The viz can change like on a dime. Over the water, there usually be fog, and if the winds change, then that fog can roll right over the airports and it can be fogged in for days. You just have to hope the winds don't change. But the winds have changed. When I was getting the plane ready, I could see some fog coming in from the, from the coastline. It's kind of on my mind at that point. <laughs> There's no time to waste. We really just wanted, wanted to get out of there. But before that can happen, they need to refuel the plane, and that may take some time. There are no fuel trucks in Toloyawak. Get our fueling kit out. It's basically just a kit in a box with two uh, gas-powered pumps and a nozzle. Before I left, uh, they both worked just fine. We had a lot of trouble with the gas pumps. Today. We left in the back of the plane, where it was minus 20 on the, on the way up. And uh, in hindsight, we should have uh, had them in the cockpit the whole flight so that they were nice and warm. With dense fog rolling toward the airstrip, this rookie mistake could leave the crew grounded for days high above the Arctic Circle. In the high Arctic settlement of Tuluyawak, Buffalo's DC-3 crew is racing against the weather. Me today. Dense fog off the coast is threatening to engulf the remote airstrip, grounding them. And if the crew can't get their frozen refueling pumps working, they won't be going anywhere. They were in the back of the bus there, and probably at minus 10 or something like that for the trip and overnight. With just one pump working, 
Refueling the aircraft will take twice as long. You know, it's a pretty uh, terrible feeling when you're so isolated in the middle of nowhere. We had fog coming from behind us, just getting worse and worse and worse. The fog is starting to close in on the airstrip around them. Basically, as we were waiting, the fog just rolled in. We got uh, DC-3 fueled up, and we got out of there as soon as we could. Visual at 2205, got visibility down to one-eighth of a mile, freezing fog. Oh, OK, we check that. Eighth of a mile. It went from an eighth mile to probably, I don't know, 16th of a mile. We, I could hardly even see the first runway light, so I had to keep asking Sean if we're on the runway. I can't see anything, Sean. Does that look like a runway to you? Yeah, yeah. It does? Yeah. Also, it doesn't help. We don't have a really good defrost, so as I'm taxiing, I'm scraping the window with a scraper, and so is Sean. I can still barely see runway lights out there. Even as they taxied to the runway, the conditions worsened. I was turning around and I heard a really loud bang. Fuck that. I don't know what that was. It sounded like a, a shotgun going off. That's it, maybe? Thought maybe that's his backfiring. We both looked at each other and that was ice coming off the props. Ice is forming on the propellers and chunks are flying off. Oh, man, the wing looks dull and like it's got ice on it. There's well over an inch of ice on the, uh, on the prop. Oh, yeah? Well over. I didn't think it was possible to get an inch of icing idling on the ground. All right, tell back. Uh, totally the takeoff has been foiled by the fog. They decide to taxi back. Yeah, we were pretty frustrated. I shut down an engine and checked it out, and uh, the props were completely covered in ice. With ice on the prop and tail wing, it's a good thing they didn't take off. And going from sky clear to an eighth of a mile was something I've, I've never seen before. But almost as fast as this fog bank rolled in, it moves on. It's the window they need. They scramble to take off back to Yellowknife. A 900 kilometer flight south, but they're not home free yet. At Buffalo HQ, new senior manager Dwayne Hicks is cracking the whip. Changing the culture here is very, very simple. I think over the years, everybody's kind of gotten complacent. Once you add structure to it, everybody gets happier. Good, Mike. Everybody gets a warm, fuzzy feeling and we all move forward. He may have the stuff to help us become more of a, an efficient airline, but he still hasn't really proven too much yet. But Dwayne can't anticipate every twist. There's always the unexpected. A surprise passenger is showing up in Buffalo's waiting room. Uh, once before that, yeah. Former Canadian heavyweight champion George Chavalo faced off against the likes of Muhammad Ali, George Foreman, and Joe Fraser, and was never knocked down, let alone knocked out, in nearly 100 pro fights over 23 years. George is on his way to a speaking engagement in Hay River. You, you hang in there, and I'll be back to... He's a few hours early for his flight, and he's getting hungry. What do you want? I'll get you, you want a sandwich or something picked up? Uh, well, maybe a hamburger or something. Diet Coke or something. You want a cheeseburger? Did I cook? Why don't you just go over to the terminal and pick it up? Okay. okay my son, my youngest one, yeah. Mikey, he looks like you. Yeah. Big guy, huh? He'll get you all that stuff and then come back here. But instead of quickly grabbing takeout, Mikey has another plan. You want yeah. the best cheeseburger? My, my dad said go to the airport. We can get you a better one. Okay, we'll get a better one. I got lots of time to kill. Oh, yeah. As long as you're OK with it. I'm yours all day. OK, good. In a flash, Mikey clears his schedule. George Savalo's name is instantly recognizable for uh, you know a boxing fan, and especially a Canadian boxing fan, because he, you know, he's a legend. A leisurely lunch wasn't in Mikey's day planner, but he's learned to go with the flow. That's the thing about the North. It's, it's very 
very unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen next. I think it's pretty predictable. It's always cold here. <laughs> <laughs> but Dwayne's not used to people playing things as they come. Mikey has a lot of energy. A very likable kid and a good talker, a good spokesperson for Buffalo. Hey, Shirley Bob Sportsman. Yeah, Shirley Bob. But as a manager, you keep your timelines, you keep things getting done. This looks nice and comfortable. How you doing? As for operations of the company and the inside of it, I don't see that right now. If there's one true champion of the world, it's the biggest guy. Once in a lifetime opportunity, you know, business people pay, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars just to, you know, have lunch with these boxing legends. And, you know, I got to do it for free, so that's really cool. Yeah, you're good. Over the high Arctic, Captain Gord Cooling's flight home has been uneventful. So far, 3.3. We're 150 miles uh, south of Toliawak on the way home. And uh, I noticed the left oil pressure flickering. Hey, John, does that look you? After watching for a few minutes, we noticed it was going down. The vintage DC-3 has no oil quantity gauge. All Gord and Sean can do is watch oil pressure and engine temperature for sudden changes. We were just staring at the oil temperature gauge and expecting it to, to rise, because in both of our experiences, when the pressure drops, the temperature rises. If there's a leak in the lines from the oil tank, the engine temperature would suddenly spike as the tank runs dry. But uh, the oil temperature wasn't rising at all. Which might just mean that the tank isn't empty yet. You got to make the right decisions now because uh, you're a long way from home, and and uh, it all depends on you now. Thanks. Travis. Yep. What do you think? I'm just watching. I don't know. Running a car out of oil. Same thing. The only thing is you just can't pull over the side of the road. You're in the air. Totally different now. Temperature steady. Travis, if you really had 20 psi. The temperature of your eyes. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm kind of thinking it's an indication. We thought that maybe there was an indication problem. Something that is happening on the gauge isn't actually, in fact, happening at all. But Gord can't be sure. The left engine could be losing oil. Oil is the lifeblood of the engine. After losing oil blood, uh, you got nothing to nothing to keep you going. If there's an oil leak, the left engine could seize without warning. Three and a half hours the all night. Temperature's still steady. Totally agree the temperature's steady, but three and a half hours to go. The airport's up there, you know, they're, they're three to 500 miles apart. If he misses one, he's a long way for his next haven. Gord has two options. Risk continuing on to Yellowknife, or find somewhere to land. Over the high Arctic, Captain Gord Cooling is dealing with a potentially massive oil loss in his DC-3's left engine. Travis? Yeah? What do you think? I'm just watching. I don't know. He's still three hours from Yellowknife, and he needs to make a quick decision. Three and a half hours to Yellowknife. Temperature's still steady. you got to make the right decisions now, because uh, you're a long way from home, and it all depends on you now. OK, we're going to Cambridge. Gord makes his call. Okay, we're going to go to Cambridge? Yeah, we're going to Cambridge. OK. The tiebreaker was that we had three and a half hours to go to Yellowknife, and I didn't want to be staring at that oil pressure gauge for three and a half hours, because I probably would have white hair right now. He diverts to Cambridge Bay, 55 minutes away. 409, we're diverting to uh, Cambridge Bay at this time. And all they can do now is hope the left engine doesn't seize before they get there. If it does, they'll have only one chance to land. They won't have enough power for a second try. I was nervous at that point when uh, we are trying to decipher what's wrong with that engine, like why, why the oil pressure's going down while the, the oil temperature wasn't rising at all. With the Cambridge Bay Strip in sight, Gordon needs to get the plane on the ground fast before a potentially catastrophic engine failure. We're not going to get a second chance with two engines. You know? Overshooting one engine is kind of everybody's worst nightmare. I could feel my heart beating, and my mouth was just totally dry. Well, I've checked some really months ago. Canterbury Airport, Buffalo, 409, down and clear. 
Gord discovers he made the right call when he diverted to Cambridge Bay. When we checked the oil left the landing, we had four gallons of oil left. Another few minutes, probably 10 minutes or so, before the engine uh, was lost. They were just 10 minutes away from total engine failure. And just a big sigh of relief, and then, and then it continues, like, what do we do now? What if the oil pump, like, I don't know, shattered or broke or something, you know? Apprentice mechanic Travis Dyson tries to determine where the leak is coming from. Travis started taking parts of the engine off to look where the leak was coming from, and um, nothing was jumping out at him. Travis needs to fix whatever is wrong fast. The weather is forecast to take a turn for the worse. We saw a result of what had happened, like oil all over the underside of the airplane, but we still didn't know why. Yes, yeah, it's pretty cleaning up here. Solving the mystery will require a test run of the engine. So Gord adds their last pail of oil to the tank. In this quick test, the engine didn't lose any oil. It's the same as it was before. But they need to run it longer. For that, they'll need more oil. Basically, here in Cambridge Bay, uh, got a lot of uh, turbine aircraft, they don't use the same oil that we do. So it may be pretty tough trying to find oil here. So the next morning back in Yellowknife, Rod tries to arrange to fly pails of oil up to Cambridge Bay on another airline scheduled flight. Somebody phoned Canadian, now phone Shell. That somebody would be Mikey. Except that under recently appointed senior manager Dwayne Hicks' new rules, Mikey has to stay out of the office all morning so he can oversee the freight transfer. I gotta go outside, Rod. I'm the... Well, who the is in charge of the operation? Well, I can't do anything. There's three airplanes up there right now. Three airplanes? Nobody even shows up till 8 o'clock. Good. I wish it was 9 o'clock. Stupid people. We have to stick to the new rules and run an efficient operation. Hello, this is Rod calling from Buffalo Airways. Um, I was wondering if you guys can, if we could ship uh, like five gallon pails of oil uh, to Cambridge. Rod gets the oil on the flight north, but it will take hours to reach Cambridge Bay leaving the DC-3 vulnerable to changing weather. Oh, nothing's good today. Oh, smart. Nothing's good today. Hellfire's up in Cambridge right now. Stuck. What? Yeah. And Mikey follows the rules and stays out of the office all morning. So he needs like 10 gallons, too. He had to buy into it. He knows that's the system. In Cambridge Bay, the engine oil has arrived from Yellowknife. With the tanks topped up, the DC-3 crew can let the engine run longer and continue their search for the elusive leak. Finally, Travis finds it. Um, we do have a leak, Gord. Cooler? Yeah, it's one of these honeycombs. See right here? Yes. Hot oil cools as it moves through the oil cooler's honeycomb-like radiator. But if one of the tubes conducting air over the hot oil lines pops out of place, that can break the seal, causing a leak. That little pencil hole basically is leaking, what was it, a gallon every eight minutes. Rookie mechanic Travis doesn't have a spare cooler, and he's never replaced one before. So he calls the one person at Buffalo who will always have his back. Hey. He calls his dad. What's the verdict? I told Travis just to wait. Me and Curtis would go up there, would change this cooler, and get the airplane out there, at least get it back home.
Anchorage Bay. Buffalo mechanic Cliff Dyson has arrived on a commercial flight to rescue a DC-3 left stranded by a dangerous oil leak. Okay, that's a cooler. He's brought his son Curtis, who's an apprentice, with him to help bail out his other son, Travis, who's in over his head. Family looking out for family. That's how it's always worked at Buffalo. It was a relief to, to, to see them, and Cliff has 30, 40 years experience on round engines. You know, it's just nice to have, have a guy like that around. You trust him and take his opinion seriously. Are yeah, you guys blew leaving spreads when you guys iced up there? Yeah, well, I believe this one that we pulled off looks like it's cracked inside. So we brought up one from Yellowknife with us, and we're going to put it on there and fire it up and hope for the best. The cooler will need to be replaced. But nothing is that simple when working on a 65-year-old airplane in sub-zero temperatures. You guys ready? No. Hey? No. no. How's that looking, first? Pretty good there. Good. Open. Close. Good. The Dysons, Travis, Curtis, and Cliff all changed the roller cooler. Uh, we ran it. Everything looked good. There was no oil anywhere, so we decided we'll just hop in the airplane and come back to Yellowknife. I'll go uh, call a girl and file a flight plan. Ward made the right call when he decided to divert to Cambridge Bay. He was only minutes away from losing all oil and total engine failure. Well, to have a cooler go on in DC-3 or have an oil loss is all par for the course. It's happening to each and every one of us. It's like uh, you run 100,000 miles, you're going to have a flat tire sooner or later. Everybody that's dealt with that type of an airplane in that type of, of environment is going to have that happen to them. The sooner, the better. You know, we enjoy what we're doing, but uh, things do happen with older equipment, and you just have to deal with it when you come to it. They handle it well. We knew they would. That's why we put them in those seats. Wow. Hey, watch out. 